<laughs> yeah, maybe a little bit different. Yeah. Some people had said that had seen me before, like, you might want to reintroduce yourself to uh, other people, but it's coming back, so I just had to start over again. All right, so uh, the whole idea, we said this from the beginning here at Life Church, is that the number one goal of Life Church is not to keep people in rows, right? We don't want everybody to come and be in a row. We want people to come, be in a row, but then end up in a circle because we know that being in circles, whether it's mentoring relationships, uh, community relationships, small groups, whatever that looks like, long-term is the way to grow your faith. And so when uh, Michelle talks about this, the important part is like she can take a chance and people are nervous. Remember, anything that you will do in your walk with Jesus Christ that will have significant difference for the rest of your life will be something you take a chance on, right? That's the whole idea of faith. Right, the whole idea of faith is we have to take step, steps sometimes that don't really make any sense. We don't really know. We don't know what's on the other side of it. But the great thing is we have to trust those who have been there. You know what I mean? That's part of walking in faith. It's part of people sharing their testimony. That's why when we do baptism videos, uh, we always tell people we'd love to know your, your story because there are people on the other side that don't know that God's still alive. You know what I mean? It still changes life. It still does amazing things. So when you tell your story, it's helping somebody understand that this step of faith really works, right? That there's those things out there. And so the stories that you hear from the people that are in small groups, for you guys that are like, I don't really know, you just got to trust that that step of faith on the other side, God has uh, greater things for you and wants you to be in those community groups uh, together. So as she said, take a chance. I would say take a chance, take a leap of faith and trust God for uh, the results. So exciting time. So figure out a way to get involved. If you can't figure out or you didn't get Michelle's email, if you write it on a connecting card, uh, she'll get with you and get you plugged in or give you some different options for small groups. Uh, they're going to be launching and or are already going. All right. The other thing is, remember, uh, at Life Church, well, don't, rem if you've been here before, you know that it's football season, right? So I know there's a whole lot of other seasons that go on, but I love football. So uh, we always have Jersey Sunday. So mine had to start early because the Bears are going to beat the Packers on Thursday night. And so uh, I wanted to make sure I had my jersey on uh, before the Thursday night game. But then we always tell people coming on Sunday, wear your jersey. And for any of you guys that are Colts fans that no longer are going to win any more games because Andrew Luck's gone, I have extra Bear jerseys if you want to come back. You know, because I know most of you defected. You know, you used to be Bears fans, and then the stupid Colts came to town, and you like them. So if you want to defect back or go to the real team, we have some Bear jer Bears jerseys you can wear. But anyway, it's just a lot of fun. Even if you don't like the NFL, wear a college jersey. But uh, it's fun, so wear them next week, and then a lot of times people wear them throughout um, the Sunday mornings through football season. All right, so we are on our third week of relationship goals. So let me give you just a quick... Uh, synopsis of where we've been, where we want to go. So here's what we know, right? That if you want to get anywhere in your life um, on purpose, you have to set goals to get there, right? Like you're going to end up somewhere in life. Everybody knows that. You're going to end up somewhere in life, but you're not always going to end up somewhere on purpose. So the way to end up somewhere on purpose is to see where you want to go, set a goal, put strategies in place to be able to get there. And if you do that, you will end up in that place on purpose. Now, a lot of people do that um, in their lives, and a lot of people have translated that into their businesses. But we feel that most of the time, people haven't translated that into relationship. Now, the reason we wanted to talk about this is because we know from Scripture the most powerful tool that God can use to change the world is not you individually, but you together in relationship with other people, right? That's the whole idea. He knows that you can be effective by yourself, but he knows that you together, whether that be in your marriage, your dating relationship, your friend group, whatever that is, that you are more powerful together than you are separate. So we knew that we had to focus on and remind people relationships are vitally important. And remember that relationships that are meaningful, powerful, and purposeful don't just happen, right? Like that just doesn't just naturally go there. So you're going to have to set goals inside of your relationship to be able to move them on purpose to the place that you want to go. And we said it's, it's in any type of relationship, whether it's your marriage relationship, dating relationship, friend group, small group, people that you're in community with, if you want to get somewhere on purpose, you got to be able to set goals. Now, we also know that that's pretty abstract, Right, the idea of how do I set relationship goals? Because it's pretty easy to figure out. If you have a monetary goal, if you want to get somewhere in a monetary goal, you set it, you put a strategy in place, you get there. Uh, if you want to be somewhere in business, you, you know where you want to be in business. But sometimes in relationship, do we really know where we want to be? 
right? Like, I know we want to love each other and we want a good relationship, but I don't really know what the goals are. So we thought if we give you four relationship goals, that it'd be easier for you to track through that process. So week one was that we need to be Christ-centered. That was the first goal. And we said to be Christ-centered starts with you. So you need to be Christ-centered yourself so that you can bring Christ-centeredness into relationships. So if you didn't hear that, go back to the, the podcast or go onto the app or on the website and listen to that. Week two, we said once you are Christ-centered, that you also need to be mission driven, which is somewhat natural, right? Like once you become Christ-centered, and we're going to talk about this uh, throughout the series and even in this week, just because you are a Christ follower does not mean you live a Christ-centered life. Does that make sense? Like just because you come to church or just because you read the Bible or just because you profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior doesn't mean that you're living a Christ-centered life. So we believe that once you're in relationship, deep relationship, and you grow and you become Christ-centered, then it completely changes the way you live your life because then you become mission-driven. There's something bigger than you, right? In the beginning, when you give your life to Christ, a lot of times it's all about you, right? Like I was lost, now I'm found, I was going to hell, now I'm not. You know, but then when you dive deep into scripture and deep into a uh, relationship with Christ, then he said, well, just remember, it's not about you, right? Your relationship with Christ is about other people, and so you need to give your life to other people. So then all of a sudden, you become mission-driven. And so he said, inside of that, this is what's cool, that the mission's the same, right? The mission for every Christian is the same, that he tells us the Great Commission is to go out. People don't get the gospel by us sitting in our rooms, so you got to go out. you got to reach disciple and send. That's everybody's thing. Now, the great thing is, is you're all going to do it differently. We're all going to reach people differently because God uniquely made each one of us. And that you individually will have a mission, but you together should have one too, right? That you in your relationship should also have a mission together. And so if you missed that, go back and listen to week uh, two of our series. Now, week three, the, the, the goal that we're going to be looking at today is we know that if you are Christ-centered and mission-driven, that you have an enemy that wants to mess that up, right? So you better figure out how to be devil-kicking. That's today. So devil-kicking is the goal today so that we can figure out that if you have an enemy that's trying to destroy you, that you're probably going to need to figure out how to fight back, right? Like that's important um, inside of that. And so how we're going to do it today is we're going to identify the cause, right? So why, why fight, you know? Identify the cause. How do you get ready, right? How, what's the preparation process to get ready for war? And then how do you get on the offensive? Now, the crazy thing is, is that if you look at and study, like I love to read books about war, you know, so I love to, to read stories about people that have been in war. One of the things that you realize is, is that a lot of people that win, if not all of the time, win because they have a greater cause, you know what I mean? So, like, if you, you read the stories of people going over to Afghanistan, they talk about why have they always been able to withstand everybody? Why have they beat back Russia? Why have they beat back China? Why can't the United States win in Afghanistan? You know what I mean? People talk about that stuff all the time. Well, in the books, they'll tell you it's because of the bigger cause, right? Like, we're over here fighting, but we're not really sure why we're fighting, you know? And, and uh, we're over here, and they're over there, like, they're saying, we're here because this is the bigger cause. So I think what happens inside of our faith journey is we lose the cause, right? So sometimes you don't prepare for war because you don't really have a cause. Now, here's how I want to explain it. Now, I think if I told every one of you that you have an enemy and that the enemy's coming to attack you, you'd be like, I know, and I'm ready. But do you realize this? Think about this. Here's what you need to know if you don't already know that. The greatest way to hurt you is to not hurt you, is to hurt the one you love the most right? Like, you all know that, right? Like, if I was saying, hey, there's this guy, so if I went to any of the guys up here and said, hey, there's this guy, and he's getting out of jail, and he's going to come, and, you know, he has a personal vendetta with you, you'd be like, I'm ready, right? But if the story changed and said, I'm not coming for you, like, I hate you, but I'm not coming you for you, I'm coming for your wife, how many of you guys would be like, I need to be ready to protect my wife, Right? I, or if they said, you know what, I'm not here to get you, I'm going to get your kids. Right? Like all of a sudden, your preparation process would change, wouldn't it? If you knew that your job was bigger than protecting yourself. I think, I hope, right? Like the preparation process of understanding it's not just about you that Satan's coming to destroy the thing that you love the most. You would change the preparation process. You would change how you think about the things that you do. So what you're going to see, if you haven't already seen this, 
Satan knows that the greatest way to destroy you is to destroy the ones you love the most. He does. Whether it's your friends, whether it's your wife, whether it's your girlfriend, or whether it's your kids, he knows the way to get you is to watch you suffer for the rest of your life because he destroys the one you love the most. So our cause, right, needs to be to understand, to fight back against the one who's trying to destroy the one we love the most. And that's why when we're in deep relationship, he knows it. You know what I mean? Like, he knows you're in deep relationship. He knows you love your kids. He knows you love your wife. He knows you love the person you're dating. He knows the people that you're in relationship with. So he knows the best way to get to you is to destroy them. So we're going to look at Ephesians. So Ephesians 6, that's what we're going to be looking at today. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. And Paul is saying to the Corinthian church, you better get ready for war. Like, if you are going to be Christ-centered and mission-driven, you need to understand that there's going to be an enemy that's going to fight back. So you better be prepared to be able to fight the war and understand how to be able to fight that. And so in Ephesians 6, he gives us some of those things. Now, inside of Scripture, because we know that inside of the Scripture, that, that the, the greatest thing that Satan wants us to do is to be able to sin. And because of sin, sin divides. But if you look in Scripture, there's the seven deadly sins. Has anybody ever heard of those before? So it's identified as the seven deadly sins inside of Scripture. If you look at the seven deadly sins, here's what you need to recognize. Those deadly sins, they're the deadly sins not because of what they do to us individually, but what it does to us in relationship. So greed is one of the deadly sins, right? So one of the seven deadly sins is greed. So if you look at greed, who does greed hurt, right? In, 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 in people, if you're a greedy person, what does everybody outside of, of you think of you, right? It hurts your relationship, right? So it hurts relationships. So he knows if he can cause you to be greedy, then it's going to hurt relationship with other people. So again, looking at how does he defeat, not just by making you greedy, like making you greedy isn't the big deal. He knows that if you're greedy, it's going to hurt the relationship of people uh, uh, around you. So greed is one of the deadly, lust, that's another one, seven deadly sins is lust. So we all know one of the greatest destroyers in a relationship is lusting after someone else, right? wanting something else inside of a relationship. So we know that lust, again, will hurt the person that you love the most. So your wandering eyes, like is it, is it really hurting you if you, your eyes wander and you start lusting after somebody else? He, what he knows is if you continue down that road, he's going to hurt it, your marriage relationship, your dating relationship. Like it's not going to be what it needs to be, right? So lust is one of those uh, seven deadly sins. The other one is wrath. So wrath is one of them. So you know if you hate somebody, <laughs> right? And, and, and you're angry at somebody, that's an obvious one. So you're not going to be in the relationship that you need to be uh, in with them. The other one is lazy, being a sloth. That's the other one of the deadly sins. Now, people are going to be like, oh, I mean, I don't really know how that works. Well, have you ever worked with somebody that's lazy, that's not pulling their weight? Anybody have their kids that sit around and do nothing? And you just want to, you know what I'm saying? Like, it hurts relationship when you have somebody that is lazy. Like you're working beside that person who's not pulling their weight. Your relationship with them is not the same if they're pulling their weight, right? So if they're lazy, it ends up hurting relationship. Uh, the next one is pride. I think everybody knows that one, right? If you've ever been around that prideful person that it's never their fault, and it's always somebody else's fault, and they're always pointing towards, and it's always somebody else's issue, so you know that hurts uh, relationship. Gluttony. We know that gluttony is driven by self-motivation, like selfishness, right? The reason that we're a glutton is because of being selfish. It's what we want. That's why we overextend ourselves in those areas. So obviously that hurts relationship. And the other one is envy, right? Always wanting something that you can't have. So when you want something else like that, we know, and we're going to see this later on, that it does hurt your relationship that you're in. So in Ephesians 6, he tells us what do we need to do. So let's look at that. So Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. He says, starting in verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. So he starts right from the beginning and saying, listen, if you want to be able to fight the battle, you better understand how you're going to win. So first, you need to be able to be strong in the Lord, right? That's why we started this series by saying you need to be Christ-centered. Because if you aren't Christ-centered, one of the things you're going to recognize is through your willpower and through you trying and through you doing more, you think you're going to win. You're not going to win. Attending church more often doesn't make you win. Going to a small group doesn't make you win. Reading your Bible more doesn't make you win. 
being Christ-centered and knowing where your power comes from is going to make it so you can win, right? Like, that's just the way it works. Activity doesn't make you win. So in the beginning, he says, you need to be, you know, find your strength inside of the Lord because the Lord is the one who's going to give you the ability to be able to win inside of this war. So he says, understand that from the start. Then he says in verse 11, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And this is what we referred to earlier. Right from the beginning, he says, put on the full armor of God. Now, he's talking to Christian people. So there's this assumption there that we can see as we read it that Christian people have a choice to engage into the war or not, right? Like, you have a choice. Like, you can stand on the sideline, right? Like, you can stand on the sideline, and you can watch everybody else get destroyed, and you can stand on the sideline and watch everybody else fight the battle, or you can choose to engage in the war, and when you engage in the war, that's why it says put on the armor. It's not automatically given to you when you become a Christian. Does that make sense? Like, you don't get the full armor of God when you get Jesus, Right? Like you get the full armor of God when you choose to engage inside of the war. And when you engage inside of the war, he says, now take your armor because now it's a representation of I'm getting in the game. Right? I'm going to get in the game. I'm going to put it on. So understanding that inside of this, inside of relationship, right, this is what he's going to tell you. Are you going to fight for it or not? Because the devil's come to destroy it. The question is, are you going to be willing to fight for it? Are you willing to fight for your marriage relationship? Are you willing to fight for your dating relationship? Are you willing to fight for your kids? Right? Are you willing to fight for your friends? Right? Are you willing to go to battle against the one who's trying to destroy you? Right? Then he goes back and he says, not only is it that you need to put on the full armor, you need to understand the schemes. Right? Understand your enemy. Understand that at the end of the day, you're not fighting against flesh and blood. Anybody ever wonder that when you're fighting with your wife, guys? When you think you're fighting with your wife or when you think you're fighting with your husband? The fight, remember this. Remember who you're really fighting against. Right? You're not, this isn't a personal war between you two. Right? When you're in that dating relationship, this isn't a personal war. When you're in that friend relationship, this isn't a personal war. Somebody else, the scheme of Satan is trying to get inside of your relationship. When, when, you're, when your kids, right, when they're fighting, they think you're the enemy, right? Parents, they think sometimes, and I always try to tell them, I'm not the enemy here. Right? Like, I'm not the one. Remember who you're fighting against. Remember what's going on. This is a bigger picture. Don't make this about you and me. Do you know what I mean? Don't make this about, you know, what I am and what you are and we disagree on. Let's look at the bigger picture of what's going on and what the end result is and who you're really fighting. Now, again, understand I'm not that person that, like, the devil's around every corner, you know, and everybody look out because, you know, there's a demon. I'm just telling you the truth. Scripture says that at the end of the day, inside of relationship, you're not fighting against that person that you think you're fighting against. You're fighting against the schemes of Satan. So what are his schemes in relationship? Because he's got a lot of schemes for you individually because he knows you. He knows how to tempt you. He knows what to do. But what does he do in relationship, right? So how does he do that? So I, I, I said, for me, this is, this is what I would see. So it starts with distractions, then it leads to envy, and then it goes to pride, right? That's how I think it works inside of relationship. So I think that's his scheme. I think the scheme that Satan has, he knows that people can be easily distracted in relationship or even in life, right? Like we can easily be distracted in the fact that we get really busy. Anybody else get busy in life and you just start going down that road and, and you know, you're, you, you don't, it's not that you're even doing anything bad. You know what I mean? You're just busy and you're going down the road and you're distracted away from relationship. And so if you talk to people that have been in relationship, like a marriage relationship, a dating relationship, friend, so you're going down this road and then pretty soon when you haven't been focused on your relationship and you've been distracted from it, how is your relationship? It's usually, if you're not giving your relationship any time, how is it? Usually not very good. Right? So if you're distracted and your relationship isn't very good. So here's what naturally happens next. You know, this one person, I envy what they have. And I envy how they treat me. And I, and you know what I mean? Like, I want that. You know what I'm saying? So like you're going down the road and no longer are you getting what you need from the person that you love the most. Is this not tracking with anybody? 
it, this is the way it is. Odd is. So maybe you've never been there. And so if you uh, let me just tell you how I, I believe that this works. So when you get distracted away from relationship, you start looking because then your needs, like your deepest desires aren't being met. And then all of a sudden they're met by somebody else. And you're like, oh, I wish I had that. Do you know what I mean? I wish what that, how that person talked to me, I wish my husband talked to me that way. I wish that the way that that person treated me, I wish they had, my husband treated me that way. I wish, you know, for husbands, like, oh, you know, my wife, and I would, but this girl treats me, some lady treats me so much differently. I wish he treated me. Like, all of a sudden, you're like, I wish I had, right, something else. So you get distracted, and then and it starts going away, and then we start to believe that, wow, I wish my wife, my husband, my boyfriend, my girlfriend was a little bit more like somebody else. Right? And then this starts this idea, and then it moves into pride. And then all of a sudden, your relationships, and you know you need to stop this cycle, and you need to talk about it, but you're unwilling to talk about it because they should already know. Anybody ever been there? You ever had that conversation before? Well, I'm not going to say it because they should already. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anybody's going to be honest. Listen, this is the way it works. If you talk to somebody that their relationship's going like that, I'm like, have you ever talked to them? I'm not going to talk to them. Why aren't you going to talk to them? They should just know what they're supposed to be. Guys, you've never had that conversation with your wife before? Like, you should just know. Like, you should know how I'm feeling. You should know that you're not doing. You should know that. Judas, am I the only person in the world? Like, I, okay, so for me, it's like my wife would look at me like, why should I have to tell you? You should already know. You should know when my needs aren't being met. You should know. Thank you. Finally, somebody's like, amen, right? Like, this is the way it works. You should already know how I feel. You should already know what I need. You should already know. I'm not talking. You know, and then they go to the guy. He's like, I didn't think anything was wrong. You know, that's kind of the other side of it. Like, I had no idea. And so I'm like, the only way you guys are ever going to get back on the same page is get rid of the distractions and focus on what matters most. Right? The only way you're going to get back to what you need is get rid of the distractions, go back to whatever. It's the same with your kids, right? You start going down the road, and you get, get away from that, and, you, you know, you look at other kids. I wish my kids were more like those kids, and then all of a sudden you have, and you're talking to these kids. I'm like, have you talked to your mom and dad about what you need from them? I'm not going to talk to them. Why aren't you going to talk to them? Well, they should know, right? They should already know those things. And I'm like, they don't know. I'm already going to tell you. They don't know. I tell my own kids. I have no idea what's wrong with you. I can't read your mind. Like if there's something going on inside of our relationship, you have got to talk. Stop being such a prideful person. What's wrong with having a conversation of saying, this is what I need in the scheme of Satan, right, is to distract you want something else, and wanting something else always causes pride, and pretty soon you're at a devastating, broken relationship because you were unwilling to get rid of the pride in your life. I've seen it. I've seen, I've seen parents lose a relationship with kids because they ought to come to me, right? They should. I've seen marriage relationships break up. If he doesn't know, then I don't want to be with him anyway. I've seen it over and over again where pride ends up and Satan knows if I can get him to that place, I win. All right, and so we need to be focused on in relationships to not forget what he's saying, right? There's schemes. You see it? There's a scheme. And so if you see it inside of your kids right now and you're all distracted and you're not focused, and you're all going to stop it before it gets started. The way you're not distracted in a relationship is to be focused on a relationship. You can't just hope that it happens, right? Like it just doesn't happen. So if you see a distraction in your marriage relationship right now, if you see a distraction in your, in your dating relationship, if you see a distraction in your relationship with your kids right now, kids, if you see a distraction in your relationship with your parents, stop it before it gets too far because it will grow and Satan knows how to make it work. And until we break the cycle... You know what I'm saying? Until we're willing to admit we need help. That's the other thing. If you need some help, there are people out there. That's the relationship piece. You can't do this by yourself, right? Like you need to figure out how to bring it together. And if you don't recognize the schemes of Satan, he will win. So recognize the schemes, understand the things that he's doing so that we can come back and be able to bring this communication back together so we can't fall to those schemes. So then he goes on and says this, therefore, put on the full armor of God. So when the day of evil comes, so when the day of evil comes, don't miss that. The day of evil is coming. 
So you're like, oh, I've never really experienced any of these things inside of my relationship. So for all of you out there, you're like, oh, I don't even know what he's talking about. Your day's coming. At some point, this is coming. He says that it's when the day of evil comes. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm them with the belt of truth. So now he starts to describe how do you get ready, right? So here's your armor. Put it on. What does the armor represent? Because the armor represents the schemes that come against you. So the first part of the armor is, he says this, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Why do we need the belt of truth as Christians? Satan is a liar. My husband doesn't love me. My kids don't care about me. My Anybody? Right? Like they don't, like you just go to, like Satan's great at telling you, telling kids, your parents don't care about you. You, you know, your wife doesn't care about you. Your friend doesn't care about you. Lying, and it goes back to the truth. What does the Bible say? What's the truth, right? What does God say? Where when somebody says, because every once in a while we're kind of mean like this in relationships. You know, have you ever had that conversation where inside of a relationship your kids say something about you? Am I really? No, you're not. You know, like there's some truth inside of all of that, but don't let God, don't be robbed by the lives of Satan for who you really are as a man or woman of God. Don't let those things happen. Then he goes on and says, and with the ble- uh, breastplate of righteousness in place. So he says, you're going to need to guard your heart because inside of this, it is the wellspring of life, right? The heart is the wellspring of life. So he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness, guard. So put up those guardrails, Okay. So if right now you're going down these roads and you're having these distractions, part of the guardrails are once the distractions start to happen, don't let it get outside of the distractions and start wanting something else in relationship. That's a guardrail, right? Stop it. Guard your heart. Go back. Fix the problem. Don't be like, oh, I can handle this. You know, because you can't. Over time, you can't handle that. So you end up into those distractions, end up to envy and then pride, and then pretty soon it's something that you can't get back. So see that. Guard your heart against those things. Then he goes on and says, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, be on mission. Part of the reason you're distracted, why do you get distracted? Because you're not on mission. When you lose focus of the mission, that's why I told you last week, you better get together and you better figure out what your mission is. You better figure out what your mission is personally and you better figure out what your mission is together in your relationship because if you don't, you will be easily distracted by what the world wants your mission to be, right? Like that just happens. Somebody else wants you on mission. If you didn't know that already, somebody else wants you to do something for them, have them on mission. So we need to be on mission. So that's what it says. And back to what should be our focus, other people, right? That's why it says the readiness of the gospel. Like our focus should be giving Jesus to other people. And so how we get that done, we need to be ready for that and be on mission. And in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. This one to me is so important because I never understood this one. I never understood what the shield of faith really meant and took I, until I took a step of faith. Like I've shared this with you guys before. So I was a Christian for a really long time before I ever took one step of faith. Like I went to church, like I accepted Jesus, like that was my first step of faith, accepting Jesus. But after that, I controlled every single element of my life. Anybody else ever been there? Like, I'm going to make sure of this, going to make sure. that. So I really never had one step of faith because every step that I took, I already had planned. You know what I mean? Everything that I was going to do took zero faith for me. I was just going to do it. And so until I finally took that step of faith, did I understand what it meant that I would finally have a shield to extinguish the flaming arrows. Because now I have something to fight back against Satan when he says, you can't do, and it's going to fail, and it's never going to work. And I'm going to be like... Are you kidding me? It's worked. You cannot destroy me. I, I have watched steps of faith work. Your flaming arrows of discouragement aren't going to keep me from taking the steps I need to in my relationships, aren't going to take me steps that I need to take in my relationship with my kids. I've seen this work. I'm going to be the initiator. I'm going to do because I know with God on my side, you can't destroy me, right? And so I never got that. So every time I'd try to take a step, it'd be like, oh, man, you get hit back. Okay, maybe I, maybe I can't. 
Maybe I can't fix it. Maybe I can't do it. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I was a terrible parent. Maybe I've been a terrible husband. Maybe I've been, and it sort of always pushed me back from the places that I needed to be. And I'm like, you're not going to tell me that stuff anymore. I've seen it work. God's alive, and he's on my side. So I'm not going to believe those things, and I'm going to trust in that. So he says, the shield of faith. And this last one, as the band comes up, this is really a challenge, right? And and really a challenge for me specifically, too, because when I read through all of these things and I talk about it, like, like I understand, you know, and, and I believe now maybe like I didn't ever believe before in my life that uh, the greatest way that Satan's going to try to destroy me is not me and destroy the people I love the most, right? Like I just know that now, probably more than ever even lately, right? Now I just know those things in my own heart. And so... I need to be focused on and remember my cause and remember who I'm fighting for and remember that I need to put on the full armor and remember that I need to do all these things. But you know what the hard part always is? And then put it into action. Like you can put the armor on and you can talk all you want and we can sit here and think about I should do, I should do. But at the end of the day, this is what he ends it with. He ends it with this. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which means don't sit back and be defensive. Get on the offense. Don't walk out of here thinking, you know, I, I need and Satan, you can't hurt me and it's not your word. He's saying, listen, stop sitting on the sidelines, put on the armor and don't even just put on the armor to protect from hurting you. Put on the armor because you need to go out and protect what matters most in your life right? You need to go out and protect what matters most. Now, here's my challenge. And, and guys, I'm sorry, but I'm going to specifically look at you. Ladies, you know, there's probably a lot of things, but this has been on my heart for you guys today. Listen, if you knew that when you walked out of here, that somebody was going to steal, rape, and kill your wife and destroy her, you would not be sitting out there saying, well, I wonder what I'm going to do. You know, you wouldn't tell her to go buy a gun and protect herself. You wouldn't tell her if somebody's trying to break into your house, you wouldn't be like, hey, can you go see who's at the door? That's not who you are as a man. You as a man are made, the way God made you is to stand up and protect what you love the most. But the problem, guys, you've been on the sideline for way too long. Letting our wives go to battle for us. Letting them be the leaders in the spiritual walk. Let them be the ones who are encouraging us to go to church, encouraging us to read our Bible. That is not their role. It's yours. And as long as you're going to put your wife on the front line, you're also putting her in the front crosshairs of the enemy. And that's not the way that it's supposed to work. And I don't want us to leave here ever believing that anymore are we going to sit back, guys. You wouldn't do it. I know you. I know most of you in here. I know if somebody was coming for your wife, you would give your life for her. Yes? You better be shaking your head yes. Your wife's going to smack you silly right now. You would. You would give your life for the one that you love the most. But why not in this element? Why not when it comes to the spiritual journey? Why won't we stand up and take our place? So here's my challenge to you guys. Don't walk out of here without being on the offensive. Don't walk out of here. Because if you do, here's what you're saying to your wife. Here's what you're saying to your kids. Go ahead, Satan. Have Adam, and I'll clean the pieces up later. Whether you like that statement or not, that's what you're saying. Because your role is to stand in the gap, to guard what matters most, and engage inside of the war. Will you stand so I can pray for you? Heavenly Father, um, today is a day, Lord, that for all of us, we know to engage into this battle takes great courage. And I know this personally. I can't muster that courage on my own. So, Lord, I need your help. Lord, I know for all of us as men specifically, Lord, it's tough. We get distracted. We forget. 
our role. We forget what you designed us for. Lord, remind us today why you've made us. Remind us what you've called us to. Remind us to not only put on the armor, but to be on the offensive, to protect the ones we love the most. And Heavenly Father, most of all, I pray that through all of this, like through our relationships, this is the key, right? In our dating relationships, our marriage relationships, the people that we're in relationship, the key is at the end of all of this, it's not about, about us winning a war, it's about you getting the glory that you deserve. So in the midst of the battle, Lord, may you be glorified. Heavenly Father, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. So like last week, we want to leave you with an action step. So this will be out on uh, social media this week, and you'll be able to, to, to write it down. But uh, create a plan to eliminate future temptations in your life, because we all know it starts with that, right? It starts with that whole distraction. It starts with getting off track. And then once you, you've done that, if you're married, work on this plan with your spouse. Okay, because you have to know in these deep relationships, and I would even say inside of this, if it's with your kids, whatever that relationship is, fix it, get a plan, get into action. Don't let Satan have one more foothold inside of the relationships that you're in today. So thanks for being here with us this week, and we're going to end up the series next week, so look forward to seeing you again next week.